Joining me now is actor, director, screenwriter, and martial artist Sujith Varaghese. Pleasure meeting you. How are you? Nice to meet you, Matt. Yeah, well, I really appreciate the time. Of course, I'm a huge fan of yours. Uh, first things first, uh, when you sent me your bio, I, I got to obviously do a little bit of reading on you. You're a black belt in karate and kabuto. Uh, not to make you jealous, but I even wrote this down, all my amazing accolades here. YMCA white belt in taekwondo, trained BJJ for a month, and I did one full 60-minute boxing class. That probably makes a, a master like you pretty jealous, huh? Us. <laughs> hey, you, you know, whatever, whatever you can do. Like, I, I, uh, I, I no longer am able to train because uh, my master moved to the, the States and our dojo stuff. But, but it, was, it's a, it was a great part of my life for, like, 30 years. Yeah. Well, it was a great part of my life for about 30 uh, days. But and since you have that experience in martial arts, I feel like that qualifies you. You should be the next James Bond. How do you feel about that? Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm probably a little long in the tooth for James Bond, but I would kill to play M. Ah, ah, yeah, that would be great, but be, age, age is a number. That's kid. nonsense. Well, all I'm saying is given, given uh, I'm, I'm actually trying to be plausible and realistic. I think I would be a very good M. If, uh, if Ray Fine, is Ray Fine's currently M in the Bond movies? You know, Bond's boss. Yeah, true, true. Uh, All right. You know, well, if they're looking, I'm available. Awesome, awesome. I cannot wait for that to happen. Uh, talk about your beginnings in the entertainment realm. When did this all kind of start for you? Uh, when did you realize that you wanted to pursue uh, the entertainment world? Well, I, uh, I was always interested in creative drama and high school plays and all that stuff when I was in school. Um, when I uh, started university, you know, I come from an immigrant family, Indian family. Uh, my whole family are doctors. My father is a doctor, or his father was a doctor. And I have an uncle who was a doctor, two cousins who were doctors. Guess what I was supposed to be? And in fact, I, I um, ticked off both pre-med and drama as my major in uh, university. So I was the first double major, but I just never got around to applying to medical school. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I ended up getting a, a degree in theater. I didn't really <clears throat> plan or expect to be an actor. I mean, I, this is going back, I'm pretty old. And, and, you know, back then there were no brown actors on stage or on screen, at least in North America. And so I was trying to be a writer primarily. And I, and I actually broke into television in Canada as a writer. And I wrote a lot of drama. Um, I started writing drama for CBC when I was still in graduate school and I wrote an episode of a TV show that got made and that's how I started. Um, I think the second or third thing I wrote was a movie for CBC, which I think they forget they made because this was in 1983 that it was on, but it was the first sort of multicultural romantic comedy that they'd ever done. And we couldn't find an actor and I, the show was gonna be ungreen lit if we couldn't cast it so i begged them to let me audition uh and uh i got the part and that's really how i started acting and and so for 30 years i've been you know toggling between writing acting and then i was the first uh, minority to go to the canadian film center as a director um so you know between the three i make a living and uh and i'm i'm very grateful that i have i mean being able to write allows me, you know, if the acting isn't do, uh, doing great one year, maybe my writing is. And if the uh, writing isn't, oh, hopefully the acting is. So being diversified has allowed me to have a career in the arts, really. Yeah, absolutely it has. Now, when you made that initial transition over from writing to acting, that first experience acting, was that kind of a nerve wracking uh, experience for you? Or did you feel like it kind of came rather naturally? Well, it was uh, a bit nerve wracking because it was the lead in the movie and I was, you know, carrying the film. I was in every scene. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I mean, I, yeah, I think I was probably nervous way back then, but, but there is, there was a sense of being comfortable um, doing this. And I think that's perhaps one of the, keys to being able to do it is you, you do have to be comfortable in front of the camera or you have to be comfortable on stage. I mean, I'm actually 
kind of a shy person in real life, but that doesn't, that's not who I am in front of the camera. And that's not who I am on stage. And I think that that um, comfort of being seen is there's a whole psychological thing there, which uh, I think allows me to do what I do. So, so to answer your question, I, yeah, I think I was nervous way back when, but I was also, I also found a kind of artistic home uh, that I continue to feel comfortable doing. And that I think allows me to do what I do. I am genuinely curious about this. So obviously you are a really accomplished writer as you are an actor. Now, when you spark a character uh, into existence, whether that's in theater or uh, for the screen, do you feel like it's, and, and, and like you're the actor for that character, do you feel like it's easier to, and since you kind of created that character to act in that way, or is it easier when someone kind of hands you a script and you just kind of take on that character? Uh, I would, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I've written something that I've acted in, you know, two or three times. Otherwise, you know, I've written stuff that other people have acted in, or I've acted in something that somebody else has written. Um, the times when I've crossed over, I would say, uh, what, what I've learned from that is that I bring the, the storytelling knowledge that I have as a writer, I bring that to what I do as an actor. So that when I acted in something I wrote, well, I knew a lot about who that character was because I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was able to kind of get under the skin of the material pretty easily because I wasn't filling in the blanks for myself. I, I could talk to myself basically and, and know what, what the writer's intention was. Um, as an actor acting in somebody else's writing, I think that I bring that storytelling sensibility to that. So I get under the skin of the material uh, kind of as a writer. You know, I try and understand the subtext or I understand, you know, create um, a backstory for the character that makes sense for me so that when I walk into a scene, I'm in character. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm not just showing up and hoping that the camera likes me. Right. Uh, and, and I think that um, makes me realize that if I could put my profession on my passport, I wouldn't put actor, I would put storyteller, because really what I've learned over doing this for so long is that writing, directing, acting, editing, it's all the same job. Yeah. It's storytelling. It's just storytelling at different points in the process. You know, writing is storytelling before the camera rolls, or we're storytelling on paper, and directing is storytelling behind the camera, acting is storytelling in front of the camera, mm -hmm. editing is storytelling after the camera's finished rolling. And if you don't really bring a storytelling sensibility to each of those jobs, I don't think you can do those jobs. And because I do all of those jobs, or I have done all those jobs, I know that that's what I have in common. That's why I'm able to, is because ultimately it's storytelling. So that when I'm working as an actor, I think I'm a really good collaborator with the writer and the director and the lighting, director and the costumer because they're all doing the same thing too which yeah. is trying to tell the story and and if you understand story then you can be in sync with all of those other departments and you can do your job and you realize that they're there to do the same job and and that responsibility means we all have to know what the story is and we all have to be committed to telling that story uh in the same way mm -hmm with our respective crafts. So I, I think that's really what it boils down to is having a storytelling sensibility has enabled me to do all of those jobs. I love how it's all uh, interconnected. Now, again, as a writer, is there a character that, that you've uh, once again sparked into existence that you'd like to play on the screen? And, and if so, describe that character that you created. Well, I, I mean, to be honest, while I, I'm very fond of that movie I wrote, um, I ended up about 20 years ago, I wrote an episode of a, a police drama, a police series called Blue Murder. And uh, I wrote a part for myself in it. I still had to audition for it, but I got the part. And he was an undercover cop. And, you know, for someone like me to be seen as an undercover cop, you know, and I had a scraggly beard and I was like one of these guys who was just, you know, uh, I, and I hung out with undercover cops when I was writing it to research the writing part of it. So I was copying one of them basically when I was playing the part and, uh, and that was pretty cool. So, you know, 
being able to, you know, the, the great thing about this job, whether I'm writing or acting, is being able to go through a door and be or experience or become an expert at something that I would never know otherwise. Like I, I act on a show called Transplant now, which is a big hospital drama. And um, aside from coming from a long line of doctors, it's you know not something I do in my everyday life, being a brain a surgeon. What's wonderful about it is that their um, demand for authenticity on that show is so strong, they'll bring me in two days early to learn how to do the operations. So when we have operating scenes, I, we've rehearsed those operating scenes two days earlier with a surgical nurse who teaches me you know, all the techniques and how to hold the instruments and, you know, on all of that kind of stuff. So I have to become a kind of mini expert in something and that in order to do it properly, in order to, for the camera to believe I'm, I'm the real deal. In fact, when we did one scene, it was a big operation scene, uh, you know, and I, I was assisting uh, in a C-section and we had a real OBGYN doing the close-up. It was her hands on the close-up because we want to get it right. And, you know, it's a, it's a prosthetic uh, uterus and a, uh, you know, fake baby. Yeah. But, um, but I asked her afterwards, you know, if this acting thing doesn't work out, and she says, absolutely, you can assist anytime. Come on. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so that's one of the great things. And, you know, I, I've written, like I said, I hung out with undercover cops when I was writing police show and, and just, you know, all of those things, being able to go through doors you would never go through otherwise, that's the great thing. Uh, uh, thing to be able to do. Huh. I absolutely love that. And, and obviously you are phenomenal in uh, transplant. I would feel, I'm going to make the assumption that your background or at least, uh, you know, d d uh, getting a degree in pre-med has in, in any way, has that kind of helped you uh, within, you know, this role? Well, no, I mean, pre-med is basically not medicine. It's yeah. sciences and all that stuff. I would say that what does help me is that, um, you know, I, I know, I knew a lot of doctors growing up and, sure. uh, and I got to hang out. I got to go on rounds with my father once or twice, uh, you know, because um, I think I was in university at the time and he wanted me to film one of his procedures because it was a very unique method that he used. And he said, if we don't get this on film, nobody will ever know about it. So I went in and I scrubbed up with him and I, and I did rounds with him and I saw how he talked to patients and, you know, so, so that, sort of very personal experience is what I've been able to apply to transplant. Now, the difference is, I don't know if you watch transplant, but the doctor I play on transplant is not like my dad. I mean, my dad was a much nicer guy than, uh, than Dr. Singh. However, I don't want to give away too much. You know, we're in early stages in transplant if you're watching on NBC and, uh, uh, he's, he's not, I'm not as bad a doctor or a, I'm not a, as mean a guy as people think I am early on. But anyway, um, uh, whether it's a transplant or I, I do another show called Kim's Convenience, and, and, and in both those cases, I have um, modeled certain aspects, speech patterns, uh, attitude, whatever, on people that I, I've run across, you know. And, and so I'm not. I'm not that good an actor that I can make all this stuff up. I actually do steal from real people and, you know, and that's called research really, you know, I mean, when I, when I started working on Kim's convenience, um, you know, when I read the script, something struck me in the way in the writing that suggested a particular speech pattern that I had noticed somebody I knew quite well embodied. So I said, Oh, I'm going to steal the way he kind of shouts out every, once in a while, you know, and that's what I ended up doing. And it's, and it's become kind of a, a way into that character whenever I get to do Mr. Meta on Kim's Convenience that enables me to sort of write, be in that zone, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And with, with the transplant, the same thing. There is, it's, it, you know, it, it starts in the writing and, and because I am sort of now in it so much, um, I think those things that I brought to it saying, oh, I'm gonna be like that doctor I met once, who's a bit of a hard ass, and have that sort of way of speaking and all, you know, certain things that I remember. Now I don't have to think about that, right? Now I sort of, I own that and I put it on like a, like a, my, my uniform, you know, my artistic uniform, 
and then I can go and do uh, do the show. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Now, has that person that you kind of uh, embodied uh, for, for Mr. Meta, has that person found out that you've done that? Uh, no, no. Um, it's, uh, it's actually, well, I shouldn't say, but, but uh, um, he, they might, he might find out someday because it's not, I'm very, very close to, who, uh, to him. So uh, I don't even know if he watches the show. That's the thing. So, so if I... I, if I ever run into him, I, I will tell him. There's another person that I do also copy. I mean, he's a, Mr. Met is a combination of a couple of people. One is this person I, I, I don't name, but another one is, I don't know if you know, there's a very famous Canadian um, Indian chef who was, on, who was one of the dragons on Dragon's Den, uh, Vikram Bidge. And he's a bit of a role model for Mr. Metha too. But that speech pattern thing I talk about, that's based on somebody uh, somebody else. and. You know, so so I do. You know, try and bring stuff from from what from life, basically, and and, and put that into the characters. Yeah. I think that kind of reminds me of a lot of the uh, processes for uh, authors. How, like, you know, in order for them to to get their novel idea, it's typically based off a real life experience that they had, and sometimes that the outcome is really their best work. You know, totally. And and if you you know if you don't have real life experience. You got to get it. In other words, um, you know, I I used to write a lot of what are called industrial films, so they're sponsored, and one was sponsored by U of T Law School, and I went and hung out with lawyers for three months. You know, at all different sizes, shapes, and you know, levels of type of practices, and you know, some were crown attorneys, some were big corporate lawyers, whatever, and I had to sort of soak up who they all were and what they did and and I, you know, a lot of the dialogue that's in the, the thing that I wrote, I stole from, from them. You know, I, I'm not that good at making stuff up. I'd rather steal from life and put it in. You know, what I do understand is story structure. So I can take what is random in life and give it a structure. But, but the best stuff uh, comes from the truth, right? And, and what we do for a living is to try and tell the truth. And whether it's an actor, or writer, or whatever, you're you're trying to be truthful. I mean, I always say to people who think, you know, like me on Mr. Uh, on Kim's Convenience, and they think I'm so funny or whatever. I say, you know what? I am. I swear to God, I'm not trying to be funny. Uh, I, I really am not. I am only trying to be truthful within the world of that story and within the world of that script. And and you know, hopefully, the script is you know the the funny is in the writing. Uh, because if it isn't, there's nothing I can do to make it funny as an actor. But if it is there, uh, then it'll be funny, not because I'm being funny, but because I'm being truthful. And the same thing applies to Transplant. You know, the, they're two very different shows, two very different genres. One is a comedy, one is a serious drama. Uh, I'm very lucky to be able to be on both shows at the same time. I think that's kind of unprecedented, you know, especially for a brown actor. Uh, and the, the characters are so completely different, uh, which is a real thrill as an actor to be able to have both of those things going on on TV at the same time. But in both cases, I'm not trying to be anything but truthful, right? And, and that to me is, is why, if it, if it is successful, that's why it's successful. Well, you do just that, and you are a fantastic actor. You tell the stories very well. Being a huge fan of Kim's Convenience, I am really curious as to how you got that role. Uh, wh what did the whole process kind of look like for you? Well, that, that's kind of interesting. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I actually was called into audition for the part of Mr. Kim's friend before the show started filming, and uh, didn't get the part. Well, that's okay, you know, in that showbiz. Then about halfway through season one, they called and, and they said, look, there's this other part we'd like him to do. We're going to show his audition to the network. And if they like it, um, we'll, he'll come in and do that one episode. So they called the next day and said, you should, yeah, he, they, they're fine with it. So he'll come in and do this one episode. And it was my first episode as Mr. Meta. And I went in uh, to rehearse with Paul. And we'd done a movie a few months earlier. So we already had chemistry. And, and it really went well. And then um, they, you know, I was supposed to do the one episode and then they called and booked me for two more episodes. And when I saw the scripts for the other episodes, I recognized that they had the same dialogue for the part that I originally had auditioned for. 
<laughs> so clearly what had happened was that didn't work out and they transferred that character stuff to Mr. Meta and I ended up doing it and now I've been in the show ever since. So, you know, it's one of these showbiz stories. Like you don't, uh, you don't plan on it. It just, uh, it just worked out. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Before we go, I want you to offer uh, some piece of advice to future actors, to future writers uh, within the entertainment realm, because a lot of my interviewees are, are rising up and comers. So, so what advice would you uh, offer them? Well, you know, every story is different. And uh, how, how I succeeded or broke in is not going to be how everybody else does. So I think, first of all, recognize that your story on how, how to do this and how to get into the business and all that stuff is going to be yours and yours alone. So don't try and copy somebody else's path because it's not going to work. Um, I would say the one thing I would, I would want of, you know, up and coming writers, actors, whatever, read more. Um, a lot of people I work with, uh, young actors, really aren't uh, aware of the, the literature of our, of our craft, the great plays, the great screenplays, uh, and, and, the, and the great films, and the great, you know, all of that stuff, or the great paintings. I mean, all of those things are the, the you know, the wheels that went before you showed up. And if you're not completely aware of all of that material, you are hobbling your own ability to succeed. So I think that's what would be my biggest piece of advice is to educate yourself and do far more in terms of that than anybody tells you to. Uh, you know, I've got 600 screenplays on the hard drive of my computer, right? And um, I have a, you know, four bookshelves full of stage plays. And I mean, you, you need to know that stuff. And I think that's, where a lot of younger actors let themselves down by not doing that kind of homework. Yeah, that's, so that's, what, I would, that's what I would recommend. <laughs> well, Suja, this has been an absolute pleasure meeting you. I'm gonna leave the floor to you. Anyone you'd like to thank, how can people find you on uh, Instagram, Facebook, your website, all that good stuff? I, I am, um, you know, addicted to social media myself. So I'm pretty easy to find. I have a Twitter, at Suja Varagis. I've got Instagram, at Suja Varagis. I've got a professional Facebook page under my name. So uh, anything, um, if you want to reach out or if you want to see what I'm up to, those are the places to go.